Hello everyone. Uh, today we will discuss the philosophical aspects of computing. We will base our discussion on one long essay wrote by Professor Scott Aronson titled Why Should Philosophers Care About Computational Complexity? Um, we will start by introducing, uh, bringing some context to this discussion, which is not necessarily in the paper, about uh, what is actually computing, how the science of computing was born from foundational philosophical question and then uh, we'll review some of the questions tackled by the paper, um, namely um, complexity and the Turing test and uh, like how, how to define complexity and ex like new examples of proofs that are of uh, philosophical interest that computer science could, uh, could inspire. Uh, so let's start with uh, maybe what is computer science and what is computing? I can talk about com the history of computing at least. Uh, so uh, back in the 1920s uh, and mostly 30s, uh, people were asking a lot about uh, logic. Uh, it was the, the crisis of, uh, of logic, uh, the foundational crisis the of, of logic. Um, so what do we mean by that? It, it, well, we simply mean that uh, it wasn't clear back then what logic was. Like, it, it seems like this very basic concept that Aristotle uh, solved uh, uh, 2000 years ago and uh, Aristotle did say a few interesting things but uh, in the late um, 1900s people found out that uh, what we meant by logic was not clear at all and, and that you could easily come up with paradoxes uh, the most famous of which is uh, Russell's paradox that essentially shows that uh, it's hard to make a consistent theory of logic and then in the 1930s, there was this guy called Gödel that showed that it was uh, well, essentially impossible to make a, a, a really nice theory of logic. Uh, by really nice, we mean uh, consistent, like there's no paradox, and also complete, like uh, everything that is true has a proof, something like this. And uh, this was all interesting. It was more about uh, true or false. But then in the 19, 1936 in particular, well, it started before that, but in 1936 in particular, uh, two uh, brilliant scholars uh, named um, uh, Alan Turing and uh, um, Alonzo Church independently, like the two uh, worked independently. But each of them uh, was asking not only about like, is something true or false, does it have a proof or not, which are technically slightly different questions, but they also ask the question like, can we find the proof? Is there a way to find the proof? And if you think about it, this is actually much more, like arguably much more important uh, because if you can prove that something has a proof but that cannot be found, well, th this is quite deep. Like it, it, it's about, uh, it's also much more practical because it's, it, it tells us about the limit of, uh, of what can be done in practice. And this was a lot about uh, logic and, and also language, like what can be said, uh, what can be uh, explained. So like Alonzo Church has more, a more language-based uh, theory of logic and are entering more of a, of a procedural, of a mechanical-based uh, approach to logic. But they, they, the, the two turned out to be equivalent. So uh, also, it's quite, quite a miracle. Also maybe important in this part of the discussion is to, to mention one of the dogmas of, of mathematics uh, probably best um, and, and, and of sciences in general, uh, probably best um, summarized by Hilbert's quote. Um, we, we must know, we will know. This dogma prevailed um, in a lot of, um, y you can find it in different forms um, in, in, uh, in the historical literature of science that if we don't know, we're just not good enough and one day we'd know. And if we can't prove something, we're just not good enough and someday we'll prove or we could also prove that it doesn't have a solution, but we will, we will do it one day, yeah. once we do, or, and so it's, it's just a matter of time. Uh, and this is how Hilbert told, like summarized this in, in the famous uh, Congress of Mathematicians. And, uh, yeah. and actually the, the real birth of, of modern computer science, um, as we know it, is a negative, negative answer uh, to, yeah. to this question, to the decision, the decision problem. Uh, so like the, the which, which is very very easy to to, to take to simplify is as, as you say like you have a question could you decide what is the answer to the question you have you have a conjecture could you ha could you have a proof 
that the conjecture is true or false. So it's called the decision problem. And, and actually, Alan Turing was just trying to solve the decision problem, answering it by the negative. And by the, while doing that, he, he, he realized that actually a lot of the questions could not be decided. And uh, there, is a, there is a subset of questions that we can define as the decidable ones. And then he proved that a question is decided and like it can be, sorry, a question can be decided if and only if it can be decided by a step-by-step -step procedure. So it, it's just a thought procedure and there's, there's nothing concrete in it. It's called the Turing machine. So it, it's a, the Turing machine is a, like it's called the machine, but it's just a step-by-step -step thought, uh, thought process. Uh, and that all decidable questions can be decided by the Turing machine and anything that cannot be decided by a Turing machine are not decidable questions. And as Aronson also say in the, in the introduction of the paper and many people say in other contexts, actually technology like the, 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 the computers as we know them today came just as a byproduct. And, and I think it's very important and it's not enough state in, in curriculums that, that, um, that the starting point of computer science is a philosophical one and that, that the, 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 the gadgets and the technology are a byproduct. And, and th this is also why this discussion should, should happen again. Uh, also, like another, another point, maybe not like a bit overlooked by, by Aronson that we mentioned in our book is that if you look even older, like if you look even further in the past, uh, in the ninth century, uh, the, the birth of algebra and algorithms, like th those are two fields that, that were, in, in, at least in their actual form, were born in the same book, uh, so the book that gave the name algebra by the author who, whose name gave us the word algorithms, uh, is actually motivated by a lawyer's job in solving, solving in complex inheritance cases. And in that book, in many instances, you find the word, the same word for judgments and computing. So computation and judgments are, are referred to with the same word, hisab, in, in Arabic. It's funny that uh, the day of judgment is, is called the, the day of computation in Arabic, yawm al-hisab, the day of judgment, the day of calculation. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's just not an irony of the Arabic language, but, but the, the, the very act of, compute, of computing, uh, we have a lot of examples in history where it is motivated by a judgment, by a decision. So just like the decision problem that Turing wanted to test, to, 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 to solve, al-Khawarizmi, so algorithmi, was trying to tackle the question of judgments in, in inheritance and how to make fair judgments. And we can even go further in the past, like all the way to Babylonians where calculi are the small stones that we use to compute so that we have social interactions that are based on fair and transparent judgments. And uh, so I, I, I like uh, some, one, one, ask, one, one question raised by, by Aronson in the paper is that uh, um, there seems that uh, there is now very little engagement between computer science and philosophers. Maybe uh, there is a social explanation to it is that in the 30s, you have strong interactions between people like Russell, Gödel, Church, von Neumann, etc. And then, then World War II happened where we had to, to push for the engineering part of computer science. And then post-World War II, like computer science was kept in this engineering bubble, despite the theory happening inside it, but very little engagement with the external world of, uh, of natural sciences and physics. So as much as computing, so computing is, can be defined as the science of decision-making, the science of processes, like what we will discuss in later in the topic is computational complexity, which is the subfield of computer science. So as much as the BERT was, could we decide, could we answer a question or not? The, the theory of complexity, the, the science of complexity that was born out of that is, is, is again a science of processes where you ask questions like how many steps to solve the question, how many to decide the answer, how many things to remember before deciding, how many examples you have to see before you learn the answer. Uh, or how many characters you need to describe an object. And I think Louis has a very interesting anecdote about uh, so the, the last, uh, the last uh, aspects of complexity. Yeah, so this anecdote you refer to is uh, the, the question that we we'll asked about measuring the, the length of the coast of England. And uh, what, uh, when doing this, what, what we observed was that depending on the accuracy with which you, you draw the line of the coast of England, you get extremely different uh, 
answers for measuring the, the length. So if, if you look with an accuracy at the, uh, at the kilometers, you would measure a quite, you would observe a quite smooth curve. But if you use meters for, for, for the accuracy or even millimeters for drawing the curve, then you, you, you realize that the curve of England is extremely chaotic, extremely complex. Uh, it's, it's going all the way. So, so somehow it has a fractal behavior. And, uh, and the length is, is this very different than if you measure it with the kilometer accuracy. Would you insist a little bit more on, uh, on the importance of, uh, of, of computation? Uh, so, so computation is really uh, an algorithm, is just a sequence of things to do to, to achieve uh, whatever, some task. And uh, one of the most important uh, algorithm that we try to, to apply to advance knowledge is the scientific method. If you think about this uh, method and algorithm or synonyms, like, uh, it's all about like having a step-by-step -step procedure to achieve a goal here would be like advancing scientific knowledge. And uh, it's uh, quite somehow disappointing how, uh, how, how rarely these two are come together, like uh, how, how rarely people think of the scientific method as an algorithm to be optimized like any other algorithm. Uh, and yet, uh, there are a lot of very important questions uh, you can ask because once you, you, you frame the scientific method as an algorithm, then you can ask all the questions we usually ask about algorithms. Uh, the most important is, uh, of course, like does it achieve what it what wanted to achieve? And uh, for the scientific method, uh, if you state it in a certain way, if you, for instance, take the, the p-value uh, framework, then you can actually ask like we read uh, al always validate the true theory and refute false theories? Uh, well, the answer, if you analyze it, is uh, no, not at all. Like, uh, it actually has quite bad properties. But there are other interesting questions that you can ask. Uh, one of them is um, uh, the so-called sample complexity. Uh, that's how we call it in, 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 uh, in uh, computer science. It's the number of data points that you need to come up to a, a good uh, conclusion. And, and this is extremely relevant if you think uh, what we talked about uh, multi-armed bandit and uh, uh, adaptive uh, clinic, clinical trials a, a few episodes ago. And this is really a matter of sample complexity. Like we want to come quickly to a, a good, uh, a good uh, decision. Uh, but there are other questions like uh, in terms of uh, the number of steps. So if you have this uh, solution to a problem, like it, it, it happens sometimes in mathematics where, for instance, if you ask me to compute the, the biggest prime number, a, a number that's a prime number that's bigger than the currently uh, best known, uh, largest known uh, uh, prime number, then uh, I know of a method that will uh, succeed for sure. I can write down the method and it's just computation. Uh, but the problem here is that the number of computation steps that I will need is uh, well, at least for this, the basic algorithm is exponential in the, the number of digits. So it's not tractable in practice. And this is a huge limit that we need to take into account when we're thinking about the scientific method. Uh, the, this is the complexity limit of, uh, of the algorithms. So it's, it's interesting. Like, um, uh, it's good that you mentioned the scientific method as an algorithm. And uh, actually, it bring us to, the, to another question, which is, um, I think part of which there is not enough engagement between philosophers, epistemologists, and computer science, is I believe both communities not realizing how broad the definition of algorithm is. Like, I have this feeling that like computer scientists don't realize how precious, how precious uh, the 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 epistemological toolbox they have at hand and how general it can be and how much it could, it could be used to, to talk about other objects that are at the end algorithms. Like the law, modern law is, is an algorithm. People prefer to be judged by, a, by an algorithm, which is written law, rather by, by then what's, what's happening inside the, the, mood, uh, the mood of, uh, of a random wise of the village. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and like law is an algorithm, the scientific method is an algorithm that we follow to establish theories and rule out other theories or increase the credence of other theories. And it, it, by, by looking at the scientific method as an algorithm, I, I, I believe uh, maybe our generation could be part of a new revival of, of epistemology where, where we could bring some of the, some of the things that were developed in, in computing and theory of computing and, and use them to, to, 
actually improve the scientific method and, and make it more uh, computationally aware, more algorithmic, more uh, more aware of its own limits in terms of resources, of complexity, of sample complexity, as, as you mentioned, memory complexity. Mm -hmm. And just, again, to illustrate how, how broad the notion of algorithms is and thus how broad the science that studies them is, there's a famous quote by Dijkstra who said that um, computer science is as much about computers as um, physics is about the science of the telescopes or astrophysics is the, si astrophysics is the science of telescopes. So telescopes are merely a, a tool that is used by astrophysicists, but it's not the, the real objects that it's by ast astrophysicists. But the, 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 the code could be, could be helpful a bit to understand what's happening in computer science. So there is a process. This process is hopefully going to a, an end, to a result. And we want to study, is the process feasible? Could it terminate? Uh, is, is the input that we gave it enough for it to terminate, et cetera? And, and uh, by, by, by considering these, these things, um, you can understand why uh, the, the the epistemological part of, of computing is really overlooked. There is now like the like uh, like uh, there is a growing effort among among many scientists in computer science to, to raise awareness on this. Like for example, Leslie Valiant, who is the Turing Award, 2010 Turing Award, uh, he famously says, uh, uh, "Computing is a natural science. So computing uh, could, could be could be could be seen also as a natural science that studies processes that are happening in nature. Uh, many systems in nature can be examined through a computational lens." Like evolution, like Darwinian evolution, is a is a wonderful uh, process to study under algorithmic lens, and actually that's part of an important part of um, Leslie Valiant's uh, career, but also other people, other people's work. Uh, learning is in the brain uh, is is now increasingly seen through computational lenses, and uh, there's also all the science of complex network systems, social interactions. All of these are processes that could benefit actually from incorporating in their methodology not only the toolbox like when you think of social scientists interacting with computer scientists the first image that would come to most social scientists i talked to actually wrote a paper with a social scientist on on, the, on, on this question like the first thing that came that come, comes to the mind of social scientists is we will get some computer science sci so we will get some computer science person and they will code for us and uh, crunch the data and draw us very nice graphs. So they, they systematically think of the technological toolbox and they almost never think of the epistemological to toolbox. And like we had a paper, we, so we decided to write a paper to explain why actually social scientists also should care about uh, comp complexity theory. Maybe just to, con to, like, to conclude on this very long introduction and contextualization, uh, so, so all of these aspects that we mentioned, uh, maybe one of the other explanations why, why this is not happening well enough is that there are not enough career incentives for young computer scientists to engage in this discussion. I don't think the, the essay wrote by Scott Aronson uh, helped uh, in his uh, tenure track case. <laughs> and uh, so I, I don't think that like something as, as good for your uh, CV uh, as, I don't know, a paper at uh, Stock or Fox. Uh, and, and so there are not enough career incentives and as a philosopher, uh, Oxford philosopher Nick Wostrom jokes when he, like, he said that the, the some of the most pressing and neglected foundational questions are always like left as a discussion between retired uh, physics professors. And, and like it's, it's always bad for a young person to, to engage in them because it's a loss of time and it's not helping for, for for, for their career. And actually one of the cornerstones of, uh, of our project, and at least channel and all what we do in this group, is to, to, to take part and uh, be part of this effort to strengthen the bridges between uh, computing and epistemology. Yes. And with that, I, uh, Louis, what you want to tell us about uh, complexity and the Turing test? Yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, Mehdi. So this paper uh, ch changed my mind a, a little bit because I was very focused on uh, the notion of uh, computability, whether uh, a problem as a, as a solution, as an algorithm. And uh, I wasn't thinking enough about uh, complexity. But uh, so first of all, in the introduction of the, of the paper, it's, uh, you explain why uh, complexity is extremely relevant. Uh, what's important to know about, uh, about this first is the differentiation between uh, what, 
what's called polynomial time algorithms and uh, and exponential time algorithms. Imagine a so to make the difference between polynomial and uh, an exponential, on an input of size 1,000, uh, a polynomial time algorithm would need 1 billion iterations. And today's computer can do 1 billion iterations in one second. But if the complexity of the algorithm is 2 to the n, then the time needed will be more than the number of atoms that there is in the whole universe uh, for, sim for a simple input of, of size 1,000. So, Somehow the question of whether there is an algorithm to solve a problem or not is very interesting, but uh, a more interesting question that is a more practical question is whether there is a polynomial time algorithm that we will be able to run and see finishing to solve a problem. If there is only exponential time algorithm, then it's about the same as if we have a no solution to solve a problem. Uh, to, with this in mind, he also uh, mentioned that this complexity theory is, uh, is very relevant for all kinds of tests we want to do uh, concerning algorithms. One of the most famous tests for algorithm is what we call the Turing test, whether an algorithm will successfully be able to imitate uh, human behavior, human conversation. And, uh, and simply stating the problem, actually, uh, we can come up with a simple solution. So for whatever test that you, that you design, we could simply imagine a huge database that contains all the answers to all the questions you will be asking in the test that will convince you that the test has been passed. And, uh, and simply by looking in this huge database, a very sim simplistic algorithms could, could successfully pass your test. But then, so where is the interesting question here? The interesting question is that we would like, so we, we've said that the Turing test, there is a simple algorithm that can solve it sim simply by looking through a huge uh, database of answers. But what we would like to build is uh, a bounded solution to the, to the problem. So an algorithm that is quite small, not, uh, not bigger than a human with uh, the size of a human brain to pass the test. And also an algorithm that is quite fast. We don't want an algorithm that will take uh, billions of years before being able to answer every question of the Turing test. So yeah, is there an algorithm that solve the Turing test? Obviously, yes, there, is, there, there exists some, but uh, is there a, a fast and a small one? Uh, this is a, a more relevant question. Yeah, uh, so what's very really nice is that you bring this question of the Turing test because there's a lot of, uh, of uh, well, discussions and uh, debates about uh, whether the Turing test is actually uh, a, a, an important or relevant test or not. And if you only look at it through the lenses of computa compu computability, uh, well, the answer is, is no, it's not that complicated of a problem, like uh, as you just said. But if you, uh, as soon as you add uh, the primes of complexity, uh, in particular of, uh, of memory space here and, uh, and of time complexity as well, uh, then it becomes a really interesting problem, uh, which is still open. Uh, but before claiming that a computer cannot solve the Turing test, well, you have to show that there is no algorithm that is uh, uh, that is uh, of small size and uh, able to, to to pass the Turing test uh, uh, in a small amount of time, uh, which is a very interesting question. Uh, difficult, but uh, a very interesting question. Yeah, another example where complexity mattered is uh, was for for proving a math mathematical theorem. So we've said in the introduction that whether a theorem has a proof or not is an undecidable problem. There there will be some theorem for which uh, we cannot know whether they they are they have proof or not. But uh, one one question that is computable and and very relevant also is is there a proof of that theorem with less than one million steps? And for us, it's, it's nearly the same question because whether there are proofs that are more than one million steps is, is not extremely interesting and we don't care much about the few theorem, theorems that have proofs that are that long. And this question is decidable. There is an algorithm which simply enumerates all the proofs with, with less than uh, one million steps and will terminate at the end uh, to, to, to tell. So 
this is where the, the notion of decidability fails. Because here, this is a decidable problem. But the problem is that the algorithms we propose for this will take billions of years to run because it has an exponential complexity. There, is, there will be an exponential number of proofs to explore. And uh, the interesting question here is, uh, can we build a polynomial algorithm, a fast algorithms that, uh, that would be able to answer whether there, there is a proof of size less than one million for a given problem? Yeah. Yeah, I think com complexity theory makes these problems a lot more interesting in a sense. <laughs> uh, like the, the computability version is, is what well, is, uh, well, it's still interesting, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's limited, uh, especially in terms of applications, but also like in terms of what you can think about. Uh, it's not only what you can do on the computer, but it's also what you can do in your brain. Because if you have a fast algorithm, maybe you can compute it by your brain and you can solve the problem yourself. Uh, which adds a lot more to, to what you, you can do, which is very interesting. Um, and uh, there's a, a lot of examples of this. Uh, we can mention a, a third example, which is uh, like uh, games, uh, especially the game of Go or, or chess or games like this, where it's very easy actually. This, like if you forget about complexity, complexity theory, these problems are extremely easy. Like, uh, like it would be crazy to, to think if you forget about complexity theory, it would be crazy to think that these are AI problems because you can write an algorithm that's uh, 10 lines of, or maybe a hundred lines of codes and that's going to solve this problem. Uh, well, how will basically test all the possible games uh, that you can play and you can backtrack to see uh, which are the, the moves that are always winning, something like this. Uh, so what makes these problems challenging has, like nothing to do with computability, uh, with computation, uh, or just computation, say, but it has to do with complexity, computational complexity. Uh, can we solve this problem in a reasonable amount of time? And this is, uh, yeah, this makes the problem a lot more interesting, yeah, which is, uh, uh, and, and this may be too often neglected in discussions about what the brains can do and computation and, and what the computers can do and stuff like this. We usually think about what it can do in the absolute. And if we forget about the complexity part, we're missing a big chunk of the of a very interesting story. Coming back to the uh, scientific method um, example, also like science, like natural sciences, chemistry and biology and medicine are actually full of problems that you can just solve using a lookup. Uh, like, let's just try all the possibilities. But then, uh, no, no, no one in medicine is fool enough to try all the possibilities because most of them would kill the patients. So like, you can think of the patients as a finite resource, like, and then like a number of patients that you can that you can have access to to try a drug. Uh, so you can't try you can you can't try everything on everyone, and you have you have timid, you have timid limited like you can think of patients as memory, and then the time it takes to test them and look at the results as also time. And then you have you have the two key ingredients: memory complexity and time complexity. And like the scientific method is is an eternal struggle with um, with time complexity and memory complexity. Not everyone has the resources to do a lookup and exhaustive search on all the lists of all possible molecules that you can ingest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, yeah, should, should we move on to the logical omniscience problem, uh, yes. which is my yes. personal favorite part of this paper. Uh, which I found very, very enlightening. And uh, it all has to do with my, one of my favorite quotes by uh, Alan Turing, uh, the great man, uh, that opens the, the, the article of Aronson. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read it. <laughs> um, it says, uh, the view that machines cannot give rise to surprises is due, I believe, so this is Alan Turing talking, to a fallacy to which philosophers and mathematicians are particularly subject. So uh, I mean to say that if you've never thought about this, probably you're subject to this, to this fallacy, <laughs> at least according to Turing. Um, this is the assumption that as soon as a fact is presented to a mind, all consequences of that fact spring into its mind simultaneously with it. It is a useful, very useful assumption under many circumstances, but one too easily forgets that it is false. And I think it's extremely deep. Like this is, well, this is the heart of complexity theory. It's, it's the, the, it was uh, historically, this is an answer uh, of Turing to uh, 
uh, what he called uh, Ada Lovelace's uh, objection to the possibility of machines uh, uh, being uh, intelligent because uh, Ada Lovelace had this uh, idea and it's a very common idea that uh, machines are just doing what we tell them to do so they cannot surprise us. They, they, they are purely mechanical so they cannot give rise to surprise. We know what they are going to do because we know everything about these machines and they are purely deterministic. And the reason why this thinking, which, which is very striking, but uh, the, the, the small bits that's missing in this, uh, in this thinking is complexity, is the fact that in order to know what the machine will be doing, uh, like after one billion steps of computations, the problem of predicting what it's going to be doing after one billion steps of computations is extremely hard. Uh, because it's uh, it's not clear at all that all of these computations can be, the, it's not clear that there's going to be a shortcut that you can predict the result without doing yourself all the steps of computations. Uh, I would just like, if you mind, not mind, I would just like to bring some justice here for Ada Lovelace, actually, just to put things into context. So uh, as much as we, as much as it's, it is completely irrelevant for Ada Lovelace to say that quote, as much as it is completely irrelevant for someone today to use it for today's machine. So Ada Lovelace, was, uh, she was a very brilliant mathematician in the 19th century, right? 19? Yeah, 19. Yeah. And uh, so she was working on computers, actually machines back then. And those machines missed the key ingredient we have today, which is complexity. Like machines with which you do addition, like you add numbers, you do like multiplications, I think also, and then you try to solve problems that are very tractable. So you, you know what will happen. You know that I gave the machine this number. I gave the machine this other number. I know that the machine will do the subtraction, for example. So there's nothing to be surprised with. And I think it is important to put the, the context of Ada, the, like Ada Lovelace. She was talking about this kind of machines, like very basic 19th century machines for which we know like the, the, everything is tractable. And so it is not very fair, actually, to, to use that code for today's machines. But you can't, yeah. Yeah, not from you, I'm like talking about like, like why Turing thinks it's a fallacy, because like in the epoch of Turing, it was another epoch, and we were starting to see the beginning of complex machines for which we cannot foresee the results. Like, uh, of course, Ada Lovelace also could not foresee the results, but it, 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 she, she know she know that the result would be the subtraction of the two numbers. I don't know the exact result, but I know what kind of results to expect. It's another number. And the nature of that number would be the subtraction of the two inputs. And with, with Turing, we started to foresee machines that will process operations that are more complex. And the, like we cannot even foresee the nature of the result. Yeah, so, so I don't mean to criticize uh, Ada Lovelace. Uh, no, 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 I'm actually very... criticizing the fact that something like this, this is an orphan. I'm, I'm just like, I'm just, I'm not actually not criticizing no one. I'm just like pointing out that the fact that Ada Lovelace's uh, belief is very well uh, grounded in the 19th century, but it is today, it is surviving in our minds as an orphan belief, as Julia yeah, yeah. says. So it's yeah. an orphan belief we have from the 19th century where machines were tractable. Yeah, yeah, uh, but what I can what I strongly imagine is that uh, in Turing's time it was extremely hard also to foresee what Turing saw. Like Turing is extremely brilliant. Like this, this is probably uh, self evident by now. But uh, the guy is actually brilliant, and he he had this imagination to to think of machines that were radically different from the one he was constructing himself. Just uh, just also again out of the, out of context, just like you said, Turing is just like if there is a chemist or a biologist watching us. Like actually, until very recently, the most cited paper of Turing was the the paper on the chemical basis of morphogenesis, yeah. where his initial motivation is to understand what happens in biology so that we have complex patterns, embryos, yeah. and from from single identical cells, and uh, just like to illustrate like. The brilliance of Turing is that he also foresee that we could use the mindset of computing to, to think of complex systems such as the ones in biology. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, to, to be fair to uh, Turing's contemporaries, Turing did have a lot of machines that he did play around he, a lot with these machines. So he, he, he uh, in one of his papers, he, he talks about, uh, he's surprised by some of the results 
that came out of his machine. Uh, and yeah, and that, that's something that I think is extremely deep. Like, uh, for, for a lot of primes, you can say, well, this is trivial because I know how to do this. Like, uh, it's just a sequence of computations that if I were starting, I, I try to do it myself, I, I would eventually get to the result. So, like, you, there's this sense that you, you know the algorithm because you know the description of the algorithm. And what Turing is saying is that there's, there's still this gap because, uh, well, to know what the algorithm is going to do all the time, its code is not sufficient. Like, because if it has a lot of computations to do, these computations are, are impossible to predict unless you do yourself the, the computations. Uh, and, and that's really the idea, uh, the idea of, uh, so, so sometimes it's called, uh, well, the opposite of, of that is called logical omniscience. So logical omniscience is when, uh, assume, or if you know the, the, the building blocks, the, the axioms, the, the starting, uh, the basic knowledge, then you know all the consequences of the knowledge. For instance, if you know that A is true and B is true, then we usually assume that you know that A and B is true. And, and, and this sounds like, yeah, yeah, of course, if A is true and B is true, then yeah, A and B is true. But sometimes it's like we don't make this continuation, it's still a computation that needs to be performed. And the, the, the really difficult part is when there are now uh, 10, 100 or 1,000 of these uh, computation steps, uh, uh, A implies B and A is true, then B is true. Now we can imagine A and B and C, and there, there, there's a, a whole web of connections between the different variables. Then computing the, cons the, the consequences of all of this is still just a computation, so you should know it. But in practice, you don't, because it's still a computation that needs to be performed at some point. And if you're not doing this, then you don't know the answer, uh, uh, the consequences of the axioms. Uh, and I find it ex extremely deep and, and, and insightful. For instance, you can think of the, the sequence of prime numbers. Like, do we know the sequence of prime numbers or, or the digits of pi? For instance, the digits of pi is like a very famous example because a lot of people will say that the, the, the digits of pi are, are random or like, uh, don't know anything about them. But it's like, we do know a lot about them. We know an algorithm that computes the digits of pi. So if you forget about complexity, we know, like if you did not have complexity in mind, then it would be meaningless to say that we know nothing of the digits of pi. Mm. We know exactly how to compute them. There's no surprise in the digits of pi. But uh, this is forgetting complexity theory. And as soon as you add complexity theory in the mix, well, you realize that, no, actually, I don't know the 1,000 digits of pi, even, if, even though I could compute it. But I don't know it. And I think this is the the deep inside by, by Janssen. And so, so what he proposed to do is to somehow redefine what it means to, to know something. And, uh, and you will have things that you, that you know means that when, when you are asked the question, you can immediately give an answer. And for all the rest, there will be things that you will need to take some time before being able to answer. So for example, if I ask you if uh, 91 is a prime number, it might take you a few seconds or maybe, maybe even one minute to, to be able to answer. And there are things for which you, you cannot at all uh, give an answer, even spending a uh, hundred years trying to, trying to answer the question like, what is the, the next largest uh, prime number after the, the largest prime number that we currently know? Uh, unless you, you are working in the field and you're an expert and uh, looking for these prime numbers, it will, it will take you a, a very huge amount of time to find one. So yeah, redefining what it means to know something using a complexity theory. So, uh, and you, we would say that you know something if you know a fast algorithms to, com to, to compute it. Mm -hmm. And that you can, you can, with a reasonable amount of time, answer a, a specific question. Yeah, this is a, 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 a fantastic insight. Like to know is to know a fast algorithm. This is actually extremely deep, like if you think about this, it's, it's, it's not knowing just the answer because usually you don't know the answer to everything. You're still using an algorithm just to organize uh, your knowledge in your brain. And uh, and then you, so, so there's no like instantaneous knowledge. There's always a computation that leads to this uh, knowledge, even if this knowledge is in your brain already. 
Uh, then there's the question of how fast this algorithm is that is critical to in, in a sense there's different level of, of knowledge like the faster the algorithm the more you know what you're talking about so do you know uh, what will a molecule of uh, benzene combined with a few milligrams of uh, of uh, fluid from someone who has the coronavirus added to three grams of iron would give uh, but, but, but like th this is an example where I don't even know the algorithm to answer to your, your, your question. Uh, the, the algorithm is just to mix them and and and, and wait. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so so like hopefully, even then, like, we, know, like, hopefully yeah, but, we would like we would like a fast algorithm to know what would happen without running the chemical reaction. Yeah. So it's the same. Like I know, like I have an algorithm to generate the one thousand digits of pi, but I don't have a fast algorithm except running. Like I have an algorithm that I have to follow, which is very painful. And then, after billions of whatever uh, operations, I could find that 1,000 digits of pi. But uh, the same, like, uh, do, you, do I know the results of benzene with coronavirus and, uh, and a few uh, grams of iron? The fastest thing I know of is to just mix them and, and wait for the chemical reaction to happen. And, and, and knowledge, it's like you can also, it's like, uh, that's why I actually Aronson's definition of knowledge is very brilliant, which is, Real chemical knowledge is to have a fast algorithm that will tell you what will happen before you make the room explode. <laughs> so that, like, you know what will happen without running the chemistry. Yeah, uh, yeah, but but here, here there's a bit different because you're, you're talking about algorithm that involves like doing experimentations and, and instruments and so on. Uh, whereas, like, what I think Aronson has in mind is more is more like you all you have is uh, uh, like a, a data structure mm -hmm. and you uh, and you know the algorithm to extract information from this data structure um, and, and still there's a different like it's not sufficient to have this algorithm to know this algorithm you, you actually need a fast algorithm I think this is. Uh, but yeah it, you can extend this then to uh, to to things that are not just the data structure in your brain, but the data structure in your environment as well, and you have different tools to, to, to retrieve data from this environment. And, and this becomes an extremely important uh, problem, which is really connect, strongly connected to the scientific method. Yeah, yeah to, to me, the, this, this chapter in the paper helped me to, to better understand the difference between the pure Bayesianism and the practical Bayesianism. Pragmatic. Yeah. Pragmatic Bayesianism. So the what sort of Bayesianism we can apply ourselves and uh, how how to how to properly think like a Bayesian. So uh, the formal definition of Bayesianism suffers from the the problem of uh, logical omniscience. Uh, if you tell a, a pure Bayesian the the rule of chess of chess, you will know from these algorithms probability that uh, white is winning equal to one or equal to zero. Uh, from the standard, uh, it doesn't. The base formula does not take into account at all the the time it, it requires to compute this uh, this formula. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, when I when I started uh, thinking more about Bayesianism, so the what's important is making observation and updating what you know based on these observations. But in a in this pragmatic version where you include complexity, there is another things you can do. You can simply not make any observation but stop and think, uh, run algorithms in your head, and you will update your knowledge with, without making any observations, simply by making more computation. So in some sense, maybe this computation can be seen as a, as a specific types of observation we are doing to, to help us uh, update our knowledge, but definitely uh, these computations are required and uh, there is no, no way around it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, this is one of the, the greatest insights also of, of thinking about all of this. Uh, and uh, because when people talk about Bayesianism, uh, there's a lot of flavors of Bayesianism that are mixed and uh, it's not really clear what is exactly meant. Uh, so I, I like to make the distinction between what, what I call the pure Bayesianism, which is just applying Bayes rule, just follow the, the rules of probability and having nothing else. Uh, and, and this clarifies a lot of things because as soon as you introduce this pure Bayesianism framework, then you can prove a lot of beautiful theorems and everything works out uh, uh, wonderfully. Uh, the only problem is uh, complexity theory. 
just applying Bayes' rule, even in simple uh, settings, is uh, usually exponential time, uh, if not uh, even worse. Uh, and so Bayesianism cannot work in practice because of complexity theory. And this is also a, a deep insight, a very fantastic insight. But then you can ask, what should we do in practice? And that's why you need to, to mix complexity theory and Bayesianism to see what kind of uh, approximate uh, fast Bayesian algorithms, Bayesian uh, pseudo Bayesian algorithm you can come up with. Uh, and yeah, and this is a, a very open field. Like there, there's a lot of proposals and uh, it's never clear what is, which is the best and probably a combination of all of this, all of this is, uh, is uh, probably best or worth exploring. Uh, but yeah, it really, like when you, you talk about what, how should we think, like a, a pure Bayesian would say, well, just apply this rule. And, and now we, that you include complexity theory, you realize that it's actually not a simple problem anymore. And it's a, a very complicated problem, but just, it's a, just take, a very fascinating problem. Just take whatever suggestion and add to it for how much. Just like, yeah. just apply by, by his rule. But then, yeah, as long, as long as someone proposes a solution like that, just to ask, ask her or ask him for how much, for how long, how many times, how many yeah. observations. And how many iterations, how many Bayesian updates I should run? Yeah, yeah. And I would love one, because I, I think I quite, quite often when people talk about Bayesianism, they, they, these, can, these two concepts are a bit mixed and uh, sometimes not quite well. Like what, what it is that we would want to do if you had all computational power, like no complexity constraints, and what it is that we come up with given the complexity constraints and what can, can prove. And it's going to be pseudo Bayesian, of course, because like pure Bayesianism cannot be applied. And I, I wish this were more often clarified. Uh, another very interesting idea in this, in this paper is the idea of a proof. So I, I think the, 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 the word proof is, uh, is very interesting and it's, uh, uh, it's often abused, <laughs> I'd say. Um, what it is that we mean by a proof, uh, especially outside of mathematics, is a bit complicated. But inside mathematics, for a long time, it seemed very clear what we mean by a proof. Like we have a, a logical uh, framework, we have these axioms, and a proof is a way to, to show that the axioms imply uh, a certain uh, theorem. And uh, usually you would write this proof, uh, how, like in first order logic. So like this was all of the inventions of the late 19th century. But um, what Aronson shows uh, in this paper, well, it's not Aronson actually, like there were lots of papers that he, he cites, is that you can think of proofs in, in many, many different ways. If you think of a proof as something that uh, greatly increases, but like hugely increases the confidence that some statement uh, has a proof or is true or that, uh, or even in, in cryptography, it's useful to, to think about uh, a proof as, something that someone says to show that he knows something. Something. Uh, so this is typically going to the case when you're trying to authenticate yourself uh, on Facebook, on the website, you're trying to prove to the website that uh, you have some, some passwords, some secrets, that, that means that you are indeed the, the person you're trying to log in as. Uh, then if you think of proof uh, as this, then you have this, all of all, all sorts of other kinds of proofs. You don't have to write all of the proofs yourself. You have these so-called interactive proofs, which can be a lot more efficient to prove something. And even better, uh, you can come up with proofs that have uh, very interesting properties, like for instance, uh, zero knowledge proof. So the idea of zero knowledge proof, uh, you can think of this as a sort of test where people uh, test that you know, but they don't test how you know which is a, a, a bit amusing. And um, using this, uh, it's possible to prove that you know something, but to give zero clue about what it is that you know, uh, which is quite quite spectacular if you think about this. Uh, and it has a lot of applications, especially in cryptography, of course. Yeah, yeah there, there are two ways that uh, complexity theory uh, intervenes here is the so for example, in, in the case that you describe of uh, zero knowledge proofs, uh, it, it could be that the proof you have came up with is uh, extremely long. 
and would take a lot a, a lot of computation to to simply transfer to 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 the to the person that you are transferring the proof. But if that person can simply ask you a small number of questions, yes or no questions, to verify that you have correctly uh, proved what you what you are saying you have proved, and you correctly answer these questions with the only a few steps, like uh, 10 questions is enough to have a probability of uh, one to the thousand that you are actually lying. You, you, you will get by chance correctly 10 questions only if you are lucky with a 0.1%. Uh, if, it's a, if it's 100 questions, then uh, it's nearly impossible to, to get 100 question writing correctly without knowing. So somehow it reduces the complexity of uh, transferring a, a large proof with, with simply this, uh, this small amount of data. And uh, the second aspect that uh, where complexity theory and proofs uh, are reliant is uh, about this uh, about cryptography, where we know cryptography serves as proofs because we we know that the I mean the only algorithms we know to crack it are exponentials it would take too much time. So this is the only yeah. complexity theory is the bar barriers that makes cryptographic keys uh, suitable for proofs. Yeah. Yeah, so even in interactive proofs, uh, at least in some interactive proofs, uh, while well, you're given a yes or no question, and technically you could answer this question without knowing the secret, but just by doing a lot of computations, uh, typically in graph isomorphism. Well, I'm not going to go okay. into the details, but, but the, the barrier to, well, th there's, if you know the secret, then you can compute quickly uh, the result, whereas if you didn't know it, you would, it would take a long time. And this is how we leverage complexity theory to provide this uh, zero knowledge proof guarantee, uh, which is yeah, pretty, pretty, yeah, pretty remarkable. Uh, and without complexity theory, you would not have uh, this possibility. Yeah, and there are other uh, quite remarkable things. So you can sort of uh, apply this to, to something called the probabilistic, uh, probabilistically uh, checkable proofs. Which are short, which are proofs uh, that can be verified by only checking uh, 20 or 40 bits of the answer. Uh, so if you can imagine that you have a proof that's supposed to be uh, 1 billion pages long. Well, this, uh, this algorithm, instead of reading your entire uh, 1 billion page long uh, proof, it will just look at a few letters in your, in your proof. And while well, you will do it uh, strategically in a random, in a random way, uh, in a smart way, but, but just by looking at only a, a few bits of information with very, very low complexity, it will, uh, it will be convinced that your proof is indeed valid or not. Uh, this is very, really, really remarkable as well. I, I conclude with a personal anecdote. Actually, I mentioned this paper written with, um, with this professor of social sciences. Um, so I was excited about the projects and I told Lee, uh, yeah, look, Lee, I'm writing uh, this paper uh, with the social scientists and in my part, I'm trying to, to make a point and, and I actually were even doing like what social scientists uh, love to do, which is uh, have a field work. So our field work was on Kaglers. So we looked at how Kaglers use data science to solve topics like questions that are of interest to social scientists, like uh, housing bubbles, like housing market questions and, and other very complex social questions. And um, so actually the, the part I was like most involved in is making this case that uh, if you want to leverage um, computing, the computing toolbox, like the technological toolbox of, of computing, you also have to understand the, the foundational toolbox, the complexity theory part and et cetera, because that will give you insights about how to look at the problem. Like, uh, not only how to crunch data, but also how to look at the problem itself and how to look at the solution itself. Is the solution complex? Is the problem too complex for the solution? Does the solution require too much observation for what you could afford, et cetera. And, and I told Leah that like one of the motivations for me to collaborate in this project with the social scientists was to, to, to raise awareness outside computer science that computer science is full of philosophical and epistemological um, aspects. And, uh, and Leigh told me, uh, maybe you should start by doing this effort inside computer science itself, because I don't think a lot of computer scientists are aware of this. 
So I don't know what Leo would like to add on that and why he said that. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it applies to, to many different people, but uh, like what we've discussed, uh, I think is relevant to, to, to all sorts of, of, of people, but I, I do think that there's a, a lack of, uh, of uh, yeah, promotion and understanding of these uh, overall these concepts. Uh, maybe one thing I, I would like to do is that here is like, We've discussed mostly uh, complexity theory. Well, uh, Aronson's paper is only on uh, complexity theory, but there are plenty of other intersections uh, between computer and all sorts of interesting things. Uh, and Aronson uh, mentioned them uh, mentions them early on in the paper. Uh, one of them is language. Like we, th we think of language as something well, linguistics or sometimes uh, literature or something like this. But uh, computer science has a lot to do with the uh, language. You, you talk about law, for instance. Uh, law is, uh, what, what's interesting is that law, before it was written, well, it was not written. <laughs> and the fact that it got written means that it was translated in a language, in a, in a, uh, in a code that was then readable, shareable, transparent, yes. analyzable. Um, and you can prove you, the you theorems. Improve, improve, you can improve upon it. You can improve upon it, you can criticize it, you can, yeah, this is really, really fundamental. And this is a, a, a core part of, uh, of, uh, of computer science and of designing a better computational system. You need to communicate with the, with the computer, with your collaborators and so on. Uh, and this leads me to a second point, which is uh, distributed computing. Wow. Wow. And in particular, uh, what well, are many aspects that are interesting in distributed computing? How do you minimize communications, for instance? But I do want to insist on, uh, on Betty's PhD uh, topic, which is uh, Byzantine resilience. Byzantine resilience is critical as soon as you have uh, complex systems that interact with, with one another. And this is what's happening in economics. This is what is happening in law. This is happening in, in all sorts of organizations. Then you need to be Byzantine resilient, meaning that if parts of your system, uh, your institution uh, fails, if some people have to self-quarantine uh, because they, they have uh, uh, the COVID, then your, your, your system needs to keep working, uh, hopefully uh, uh, as well as before. Actually, I'm happy that you mentioned this part, not, not it's because my PhD, but just like, um, I was also happy that Aronson mentioned the uh, distributed systems. Just going back to the scientific method. So remember we, we mentioned the scientific method as something that should be looked at as, a, as, a, as an algorithm. Actually looking at it as a distributed algorithm is even more relevant if you think of the context today where we have controversies. Something we don't like in distributed systems, so something that should not exist in a robust, like if a, if a distributed system has to be described as robust, it shouldn't have single points of failure. It's like, so there is a distributed system, a lot, of, a lot of parts are interacting, and if there is one critical part such that if you remove it, all the system fails, then that system is not robust because it has a single point of failure. And something the scientific method implemented to become a robust distributed algorithm is to get rid of, is to get rid of single points of failure. And those single points of failure is the argument of authority. So you can think of the argument of authority as a single point of failure because if the authority is wrong, all the system is wrong. And we shouldn't listen to just someone because this, this person, she or he, is a very famous virologist or, or, or a medical doctor and, and then follow her or his opinion. So, so the scientific method already behaved as a robust distributed system and it learned, and it's only a few centuries ago, to get rid of the argument of authority. Another thing that you mentioned uh, here, it's like distributed systems, the scientific method. Uh, so, so I, I just like I just explained that having arguments of authority is a single point of failure and makes the scientific method weak and fragile and not robust. So, so the modern scientific method does not have arguments of authority. Uh, and then uh, I also mentioned law in the beginning. The same, like in the beginning, law relied on the wise, the wise like the wise uh, old man of the village or the, the wise old mother of the family or of the village. And this is also a single point of failure. So you don't want law, like you don't want judgment to rely on the mood of a single person or, or, or something, you cannot, something you cannot externalize and, and review and read and improve and modify. You can't 
modify the brain of the the, the wise of the like the the, the wise uh, the wise old uh, man of the village. You, you can't read their brain, but you can read the law and you can vote on modifications of the law. So actually, writing law was also a process of of getting rid of single points of failure, which were which were the authoritarian leaders of the of, yeah. in politics. Yeah. Yeah, and the uh, last point I wanted to mention is uh, is uh, privacy. So, uh, computer science is also the, the 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 science of information, of uh, what information is transferred, and also how to limit uh, this information. So, uh, and this like it's important to have a more quantitative approach to this kind of of understanding, uh, because if you like privacy can be breached in many many different manners. And uh, and some well, I've had sometimes a disc discussions with uh, jurists that uh, were arguing that a data like a system is uh, is private or is not private, like a very binary viewpoint on, on privacy. But uh, well, there's a lot of, uh, of research that has been going on on privacy and how to limit uh, in information, and the, the, the definitions of privacy well, they are multiple and they are not binary. Uh, they, you can actually quantify. Uh, at least for different for privacy is the classical example. So uh, th there's an amount of privacy. And uh, this is like critical to organize society to know what information is leaked, uh, like indirectly or not. Uh, and yeah, so I think just like this is, I think, related, I guess, related to a lot of to politics. But like, this is just to show again, like the 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 the, the surface tensions between computer science and so many different fields. Also like besides the differential definition of privacy that you mentioned, that is not part of Aronson's paper. Uh, so just like something that Aronson wrote that could also be applied to privacy is like, what is it, what is it to know? Like, do you have a fast algorithm to get the knowledge? Like if, if, I have, if you have a procedure to know what is my secret part of my private life that I don't want you to know, if the best algorithm for you to know that it runs in a million years, then you don't know that private part of me. So like the complexity, like, com like using complexity theory to define privacy has also been a very important part of uh, the last uh, four decades of, of computer security. So we don't make things private, we just make them hard to guess. Yeah. We, make the, we make them such as to guess them, to know them, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of, a lot of, of memory. But now, as you mentioned, there is this more, more modern, which is only 10 years old or 15 years old, differential privacy is, was born in 2004 or eight, like in the, mm -hmm. in the early 2000s, which is not only like how many efforts, how much effort you would bring, but how much, how much part of the information you'd access or how much distinguishability you would get on one person, depending on what group of people she or he belongs to. Uh, Scott Aronson in the conclusion of the paper says that uh, he has been talking about lots of ways that philosophers can get inspired by uh, computer scientists, specifically uh, uh, complexity theories, but he also thinks that he could write the same essay about ways in which computer scientists should get inspired by uh, philosophers. So we, like, like we've been saying since the beginning of the podcast, that we, we every field has to, to, uh, has to gain from uh, learning about one another. Well, thank you for joining us today. Next week, we will discuss uh, uh, social media and polarization, specifically uh, a surprising study that was run uh, where uh, uh, sh showing uh, opposite views to, to, to participants in social media was actually increasing their polarization instead of uh, decreasing it. it. It somehow shows the, the difficulty, which is that to, to make a robustly beneficial choices, but it's a, uh, really something that should be studied and is not at all obvious and we will discuss in more detail uh, next week bye bye